morning, people of God, and anybody who's watching on our social media links. And uh, we want to greet you in the name of Jesus. And it's really special to be together again this morning. And uh, the Lord's given me a word that is a little bit challenging. It's a little bit different, and it's not one that I have can remember really preaching on much before. And I'm really excited about this because I think that it's it's kind of something that we're going to have to deal with. If you are looking at the news, if you're looking at the world around you, if you're speaking to people around you, you probably, with any uh, level of confidence, feeling a little bit shocked at what you're seeing, the crazy world around you, and the lack of spiritual strength that people have. We've had a year of the the coronavirus and the lockdown and all of those things and we've been doing incredibly well in prayer and bringing people through and we've seen so many miracles but the world seems to be going to pieces there are so many wild things happening if you look at what's happening in the United States uh, the death toll in, in in Europe and in the UK from the coronavirus and the the strange things that are happening and then if you look into the lives of people around us, you will probably have noticed that there are a number of people that you thought were strong believers who have fallen away. Who have run into trouble and are not serving the Lord the way they should be doing. And I want to encourage you to be very strong in the Lord. In this season, it is one to get your eyes on Jesus, keep them on Jesus and be very strong. Now I know that it you might be a little bit concerned, but I want to share with you the word the Lord has shared with me to share with you. And I want to talk about dealing with deception. Uh, you may say, well, is that really relevant? It's extremely relevant to what we're doing. And you'll see in the picture there, in the middle amongst those sheep is a non-sheep in that picture. And um, you'll see it on the screen there and I'll send it to you in the notes. But there you have a non-sheep amongst the sheep. And he looks like a sheep in every way except there's a difference. And Jesus in the word spoke on a number of occasions to beware about being deceived. And there is an incredible risk of the saints in the latter times. In the last times. And we need to be really aware of it so that we are rightly discerning the signs and the times and the season around us that we stand strong we keep our eyes on Jesus and this is the point keep the main thing to be the main thing not to get dragged off into this or that how many of you get five new theories about some conspiracy theory a day on your smartphone maybe many of you are getting a number of random so-called prophecies or scriptures saying that there's a dragon here and there's a wave there and what is this? And how do you know which of these is actually the Lord giving us input in our lives? And I know that there are there's a lot we need to learn about prophecy and that sort of thing. But there are some key things that we need to keep our eyes on and know where we are in the big picture. So I want to share a little bit about that today. So we've talked about dealing with deception and in order to understand that, we need to understand what deception is and how it works. So I want to go straight to Genesis chapter 3 and read to you from verse 1 onwards and see how we stand there. Now it says there, now the serpent, and we know that was the devil, more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now if you read that verse, you will realize that God has said, You shall eat of every tree of the garden except one. But Satan twists that word and he he says everything almost right, but there's a slight change. And this is right at the heart of any deception, is that Satan will give you a 98% c 
correct, but the 2% is wrong. And the 2% that's wrong is enough to throw us off track if we are not vigilant. So he says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every fruit tree of the garden? That's not what God said. He said, you can eat all the trees, but not this one. And so the woman corrects him. She knows the stuff. She knows her stuff. But now because she is listening to him, and she has started the engagement of questioning what God's word is. She shouldn't have allowed that conversation to start. She should have immediately said, get out of here. You are not allowed to question God's word. God's word is something that is holiest between us. And you are not entitled to do that. You leave. She should have done that, but she didn't. Let's look at the next verse. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now he pulls out the guns. And he, he immediately contradicts God. You will not die, she says. You will not surely die. I mean, maybe there's a way out of this. So now she's wondering, okay, maybe God is trying to pull a move on us. He's, he doesn't want the best for us. God wants something else for us. And this is how subtle deception is. It gives most of the ground, but it keeps a little bit of ground. And before you know it, if you keep on that negotiating, you're negotiating yourself out of your garden, out of your world, into the wilderness. Don't dance with the devil, as Phil Driscoll said. He'll make a fool out of you. And if you watch, if you sit and have conversations and discuss things, and that's why I would really encourage you, if, you have a, if you've been watching all these silly things on YouTube, these conspiracies and these strange prophecies and these funny things, before you know it, you're going to be becoming unconvinced of the scripture and the word of God you do know is right, simply by this process of deception. So I would encourage you, make a point of not allowing those funny things into your life. If somebody sends it to you, just delete it or send it back to them. My ear is not your dustbin. And so, for God knows in that day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, God doesn't really have your best interests at heart. He doesn't want you to be like Him. He's, he wants to keep the best away from you. He doesn't want you to know good and evil. Because He knew that she knew it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So He's spinning and confusing it and twisting it. And now she doesn't know what to believe. Now he's got it in the place. And it's the place called seduction. Where you are no longer secure in the relationship that you're in covenant with. So a wolf can move in and immediately get his teeth in. That's what he says. That's what he did. And so when the woman saw the tree was good for food. Uh, and uh, the scriptures call about the, li the lust of the eyes, that it was pleasant to the eyes. Okay, that it, if that's the, the, there was a, the lust of the flesh, there was the, 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 uh, the lust of the eyes, and then relating to the pride of life, the other form of sin, and its tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her to a husband who was out on a business trip. No, he was right there. He was the real villain in the story. Because he was right there. He, sh he was supposed to be the leader. He was supposed to say those wonderful words. Uh, if you say it, I don't know if you know that word. It says puma. It means get out of here. He was supposed to say... Are you allowed to say that on, on Facebook? I don't know. He was supposed to say, get out of here. You're not welcome. Leave. You do not bring God's word into question. But he was there and he somehow was not deceived, but he fell into rebellion. And that's even worse. The woman was deceived, but he did not protect her. And he was supposed to protect her. And there it says, the I, then and he ate. She gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. You know, when you fall into sin, it has this incredible effect. 
it deceives you, it deceives you, you fall for it. The minute that you've fallen for it, you look around and suddenly your eyes are opened and the devil is laughing at you and you know that you have messed up big time. But it's that deception lasts until the snake's teeth are in you. When he releases, you know that you've been infected with that poison. And that is the way sin works. That's the way deception works. And it sometimes deception will continue for a period, but once you have realized that you've been deceived, you've realized that you've been taken for a fool. And so often people insist. And then the, if they've got a problem with pride, pride holds them in that deception because they don't want anybody else to know what a fool they've been. So they act like it's all okay. But they knew, it says, the eyes of them were opened. They perceived what they had done. And they had the knowledge of good and evil. And they were not supposed to have that in that way. And the way they knew knowledge of good and evil was to know it. And the Hebrew word knowledge is not usually just head knowledge. It's experiencing. They experienced evil. They knew what good was, was where they had been. They were now caught in evil, in sin. And it says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And we find so often that when we have sinned, instead of confessing our sins, we run to the nearest fig tree and we try and make excuses. We try and cover up our sins. And it's very interesting that they tried to have a covering, but the covering didn't cover them. Fig, fig leaves don't make very good clothes. Later on, when God uh, restores a, a, some kind of a connection and he makes the promise and he judges them, you'll see a very interesting thing that was happened. That God took animal skins and covered them. Why would he have done that? Because that covering allowed them to have a relationship with God because an innocent animal would have had to have been sacrificed in order for them. And that was the first sacrifice in the Bible. It allowed the, that thing, that covering, covered over their nakedness before the Lord. Very interesting thing. And obviously we have the story of salvation going on from there. But from that point on, we, we can understand a little bit of the dynamics of deception. And the enemy, number one plan in your and my life is to do those things, to deceive us. Because as believers, you and I are supposed to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be overcomers. We're supposed to be more than conquerors. But the devil knows that if he can deceive you and make you think you're nothing, make you think that you're not good enough, that you're not strong enough, he's going to get you. So we need to know how we stand in the Lord. So let's look at it. Let's try and understand what the purpose of deception is. The enemy is one of his main weapons in his arsenal to deceive you. And then what is his purpose? It seeks to make you exclude parts of God's word. To divide up God's word and so that you as a person are not able to discern what God's word is and what it isn't. Now here I have... I have a Bible. It's actually a Hebrew one. And this one, if I look at this Bible, I need every page. In fact, if you were to look at this one, you would see that there are tiny little marks around the Hebrew letters. The New Testament calls them tittles, the little dots. And then the smallest letter is a yacht. And the Word of God tells us that heaven and earth will pass away, but not one yacht or tittle. Those little dots will ever pass away. And all of God's word is needed. But what the enemy tries to do in looking at, I don't know if you can see this, but the enemy tries to make you see and not believe that all of God's word is important. And we need every single word in God's word. Now the way he does it is very subtle. He will make you focus on just something and say, well, the rest of it isn't so relevant. That part we don't need. 
But we do need all of God's Word, and it links together. And it all hangs together, and it creates this platform on which Jesus stands, the cross, the resurrection, the church, and the coming Savior. We see Jesus illustrated by the whole of Scripture. And we need to know everything from God's Word, but deception tries to carve away chunks of God's Word and make you focus on just a little bit of God's Word. Now, how does it all work together? It's very simple. We'll get to that. But that makes you work like that. And so I want to show you a tool. Now, some of you will know what this is. This is a telescope. And um, if I look down a telescope where I'm standing, I don't know if I can see you. I can't see very much. But this telescope allows you to see something that is far away in great focus. It helps me that if I look at the moon, I could maybe see the, the sea of tranquility or I could see parts of the moon. And that would be great. But the thing about a telescope is that it then excludes all the other things around. I don't see the planets. I don't see the stars. I don't see the things around me. I just focus on that. And very often, the plan of the enemy is to make you look at just one or two things, and that then takes over the entire main picture. They say if you are a pastor, you should be a 360 degree pastor. That means that my focus cannot just be on only the praise and worship, or just doing Bible study, or just small groups, or just the preaching. I need to be, as a lead pastor, I need to keep an eye on the whole picture. And that's not always very easy, but that's why we have those with specific ministries who can focus on those things. The challenge is that sometimes in churches you get somebody who's saying, this is what we should be doing. And the rest of it isn't that important. And they don't realize that everything is needed. You need to have, and in the same way, you need the whole scope of the Word of God to keep you accurate. And we'll, we'll see that. Also, the other purpose of deception, it seeks to drive a wedge between you and God by doubting His character. Do you know that you don't, you should not be doubting the character of God? God is always good. He's always gracious. He's always holy. And His judgments are impeccably righteous. He's holy indeed. And we know the character of God, but deception seeks to try to prevent you. It also, deception seeks to achieve the goals of the devil. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Then, deception. It does not use attempt to use a frontal attack. Deception doesn't come up to you and say, there's no God. Atheism is a very blunt tool. And most people who are atheists are not able to sustain it properly for very long. However, what we find is that the devil doesn't come to you and say, there is no God. He will twist the knowledge you do have about God and persuade you to think other than what the Word says about Him. So, how many of you have heard so many times, um, they'll take the scripture, The Lord giveth, the Lord take away, takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a, that's a scripture. But when it's taken out of context, it makes you wonder, who can ever know what God's going to do? He is totally unpredictable. But then you need the rest of Scripture. It says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know how Jesus walked on the earth. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So now we see the character of God. So if you just take one Scripture on its own, yes. But then you look at the rest of Scripture. You look at, and Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. It tells me, and Jesus was moved with compassion. The Word of God tells me the more I read more of the Word, the more clear I know of God. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never fails. His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Now the more I know the Word and the more of His Word I bring in, the more secure I am 
in not being deceived because the, the antidote to deception is truth. So the enemy wants to, uh, to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. That's his purpose. And the way that he does it is by using manipulation and guile to achieve what a direct path cannot do. Deception also destroys innocence. Adam and Eve were innocent in the garden. They were naked and they were not aware that it was like that. They weren't ashamed. They, they had no sense of shame whatsoever. But deception destroys that sense of me and God have this amazing relationship. We're together in this. We're strong. We're fine. And I'm now, I'm okay with God, but when I lose it under deception, I know I'm not okay anymore. It takes a, a, a work of God and His grace to restore that sense of innocence and wholeness with God. So, what else? Deception eventually leads to shame. You will eventually begin to feel always dirty, always ugly, always something wrong because you have been deceived and that's when you need to get some help. Don't hang around with this. Don't leave deception in place and don't leave the, uh, the sense of um, I can't do anything about this. I'm too ashamed. There's no time for that. Get right with God. Go to the Lord and go and find a believer who is a strong believer who will help you and bring you back on track. Now the question is, many of us think, well, I can't be deceived. I'm not likely. I'm a strong Christian. I won't get deceived. Adam and Eve used to walk with God in the garden every day. They probably had the best relationship with God that anybody had barring Jesus, and they fell into deception. And it is arrogant in extreme to think that you are too tough to fall into it. Don't think. The enemy is hard at work to separate you from God's calling and purpose in your life. Jesus warned his disciples, the ones he invested three years of daily Bible school, not to be deceived. He told them six times, do not be deceived. That means that deception is a real risk. If Jesus says six times, that's enough to realize that he's not playing around. Different types of deception exist. We're going to look at some of that in a minute. We need to realize that there is one kind of deception for believers and there's other types for people who do not yet know Jesus. And if you are a believer, you, you should know better. But so often... The enemy works, and he works um, in Afrikaans. They say, hey, fang yo met a long rim. He catches you with a long rein. You know, when they're breaking horses, they let the horse think he's, he's, he's free. They attach a long rein and a bridle onto a horse, and they let him trot in a circle, in a paddock, around and around. And the horse thinks, I'm free, I'm free. But after a while, he realizes... I can't go anywhere else. I'm having to do what I'm told. He's caught. Even though there's a long reign, he's being tamed. And the enemy will get a stranglehold on some little part of your life. And then just leave you for a long time. And then every now and again, he'll pull that rein, And you suddenly find yourself doing things that you were not supposed to be doing. And he's got you there. And in order for you to, to and you think, well, I'm free. I can break loose anytime I want to. I'm not being deceived. Look how strong I am. But he's caught you there. And you still think you're okay. A fang yo met a long slap rim. What else can you know? There's another deception, and this is the tough one, when you deceive yourself. And that's the hard one. When believers think certain thoughts, they have certain attitudes, and they think that they're okay. But we can so easily deceive ourselves. And then there's the deception by false doctrine. And there's, that's a few of the areas. There's a lot more to it than that. Let's talk about some of the classic deceptions that people have. Um, people serve other gods. And you'll think, well, thank God I don't do that. You know, I don't have a statue of the Buddha in my house. Or I don't have a uh, 
little shrine to Krishna in my house. Well, I'm not going to judge anybody. We all know that serving the Lord is a free choice. But if you want to serve the Lord, don't allow any idols in your life. Idols? Maybe your car is an idol. Maybe your job is an idol. Maybe members of your family standing between you and God in your walk for the Lord. You say, how can that be? This is the challenge. You know you need, should be serving God, but if your spouse or somebody in your family doesn't really want to serve the Lord, well, you back off and you say, well, I don't want to really upset them, and I don't want to rock the boat, but I'm not really going to talk about the Lord, and I'm not really going to live my walk with God. I'm not going to attend services or at least watch the, the online services. And suddenly you find that you're not living the life and there are other gods not offending other people, preventing you. Daniel was prepared to lose his life and Nebuchadnezzar was going to kill him because he insisted on praying. And he got bust praying and they decided to turn him into cat food. Except the cats wouldn't bite. And that was Daniel. He refused to let any other gods get into his life. There's another classic deception. That is the consequences of sin in my life are not going to come to me. I can, I can do these things and I'll get away with it. Really, I've done it so often, it doesn't matter. You're deceiving yourself. There's coming a time. When the storm comes and not doing God's word is going to cost you your house. Very often we think that we can't be, we can't be deceived. Uh, that my wealth, my education, my resources, my preparation, my intelligence will protect me and prevent me from experiencing that. But God's grace is there. But at the same time, there are consequences to do that. Often, we sl our thinking slowly starts rotting. The, the scripture speaks about mixture or compromise. We should not be allowing any compromise in our lives. And if there's compromise in your life, you're being deceived. The other one that we so often discover is the one that says that good works will buy me favor with God. And we read the book of Galatians, which tells me how hopeless that is. But religiosity often comes in and we think, well, I'm doing this for God and I'm doing that for God. And, and I don't really need to pray because God sees my heart somehow. But the last time you had a heart to heart conversation with God was months ago. When last did you have a real conversation with God? Where you sit and listen and you ask him things and he tells you stuff. And you know that you can do that. And as a Christian, that's part of a healthy Christian's life. Now you may say, well, I've never tried to do that. That's what the Word of God is for. If you go and take your Bible and you pray and then you read some and then you pray some and you read some, you soon find that God is going, <coughs> my child, I want you to be aware of this. He will start reminding you of stuff. He'll start showing you stuff. And you're going to feel so close to God because the devil says it's going to take you so much energy and work to fix up that relationship. But the minute you pray and the minute you spend time with God, you're going to know that he's talking to you. He's your father. He's your best friend. That is the friendship. And the enemy's lies are deception that you're not going to be able to have that. Another deception that we have is that, oh, there's always more time to do this. You know, my... My dear, my dear wife had to go and have her eyes checked. She had, um, she, last year she had some eye surgery and she, um, she had, well, the year before last, in 2019. And she was supposed to go for an eye check and she had some uh, uncomfortableness in one of the eyes. And so she went to the hospital and I took her there. And of course, I wasn't allowed in the door as the, as the, um, the, the uh, sort of, uh, come along with person so she had to go in and I just realized the trauma that so many people have to go to at this day when you take somebody to the hospital and you don't know if you're going to see that person again 
Maybe they've gone in, maybe they've got symptoms, maybe it's nothing related. And that person never comes out again and you never had a chance to look him in the face, say all the things that need to be said, do all the things that need to be done. And then you suddenly realize that the, you thought you had time, but you don't have time. And in the same way with God, you think you've got time to fix up stuff. But your life is going past like a toolbox falling down a mine shaft. And sooner or later, it's going to reach the end. And you don't know how much mine shaft is left. None of us do. Are you living a life full of God or without God? How much mine shaft is left for your toolbox? Just a question. And then the other one, the other deception that you have, is that people follow another gospel. Now, it can be another gospel, but just it could even look the same, but it's not the same. That's the word, the Greek word alos, another but different. There's another one, alelus, which is another one but the same. It's like if I pick up an orange and I pick up another orange. That's another one the same, which is fine. But if I have an orange and I pick up an apple, it's another one, but it's a different one. And the Bible speaks about another gospel. Something that looks similar, but is different. And you might find that that's the one that the enemy has purposed against your life. Let's talk about the openings that we get in our lives. And I'm going to look at some scriptures in a minute. I'm just really just kind of laying a foundation still. And if we don't finish everything today, we can continue in a, in a week or so because this is quite a broad subject. What are the openings that the enemy gets into our lives to put covetousness in? Well, to put deception, one of them is covetousness. The Bible speaks that covetousness, where, we, where it's something that we desire, the desire for this, and that's what caught Eve. She coveted that fruit. It was something that looked good. It was pleasant to the eyes. It looks like it's going to taste good as well. It was a lovely thing to have in it. And she thought, maybe this will make me wise. Well, soon she wised up. But covetousness is a way that the enemy deceives us because we start wanting something that should not be ours. Sometimes the Bible speaks, don't covet your neighbor's goods. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Suddenly the enemy can deceive you and make you feel that you're not getting what you deserve, what you should have. And so you feel less. And so you get into the cycle of materialism where you try to have and when you get it, no, you, 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 you want a, a car because it's much better to ride a car than to have to go everywhere on foot. But once you have a car, you notice the man over the road has got a better car. And you think, man, if I only had that car. And so you, you never feel content with what you have because then you're on the treadmill of running after the things of the world without even realizing the enemy has caught you and you're running around that paddock and he's slowly reeling you in. Another one that you have is to, and this is a, a really stinky one, thinking more highly of yourself than you ought and this is how it goes you'll know it if somebody says something to you and instead of asking yourself wow am i really getting this wrong you take offense that somebody challenged you how dare you challenge me i'm the leader i'm the important person how dare you say that to me um, and you're not ready to listen you're not um, easy to yield, as it says in, in 1 Corinthians 13. And you think, and suddenly, and, and I find this happens so often, especially with a young spiritual leader. Suddenly the, the joys of ministry or something goes to their heads. And even though you may have spent years trying to prepare them for it, the minute that they see that they are expected to lead, it 
gives a little blood rush and they become proud and unteachable and you can't do anything with them. And that's really hard. If you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, it's pride. That's what happened to Satan. And it's so easy to fall into that place. Another, another way where, where deception creeps in is following the traditions of men. You know, if there, there are things that we do as Christians um, that allows the feeling of being spiritual. It's called religion, but there's no content. And you'll find that if, for example, people recite prayers, they think, well, I'm so spiritual. I said the Lord's Prayer 20 times in a row. Well, you could have said macaroni, chewing gum, and, and cornflakes for all you meant it. Because the Bible specifically tells us, don't pray long repetitious prayers. How do you pray? You pray from the bottom of your heart. Speak to God honestly. Reciting prayers isn't going to do you any good. If you're not meaning what you're saying and you're not sincere about it, it's not going anywhere. God's not listening to random prayers. In certain religions, what they do is that they don't even bother to pray themselves. They just put the prayer on a wheel and they spin it around and the stick. The prayer wheel must say their prayers for them because it's too much work to say the prayers with their mouth and mean it with their heart. But if the, if the little toy is reciting the prayer for them, that does the job. The, spirits, the spirit world will be pleased. God is not a fool. He looks to the heart. And we deceive ourselves if we follow the traditions of men. And there are many areas in the church today where we have the traditions of men. Where the Bible says one thing and church says another thing. And we should never allow those things. We find that uh, the Bible says, for example, that um, believe and be baptized in Mark 16, verse 16. But you know what happens? People think, well, I can baptize a baby who doesn't believe and they'll be saved. And they won't be condemned. And the Bible specifically says you have to do it that way. Believe and then be baptized. And so they come up with all kinds of clever, clever workarounds. But it's not what the word says. That's deception. You don't allow any, any separation between God and his word. And you stick to his word every time. There are the philosophies of men. Many times um, there are different ways where people bring in their philosophies. There's a, a deception that crept into the church in the last five years or so where uh, a well-known man wrote a book called Love Wins, implying, well, because God is love, uh, people can't go really go to hell. Because if people go to hell, then God has failed. How can God send people to hell if His love is an absolute? Sounds clever, doesn't it? But when you know what the Word says, it says that people... That God doesn't have to send people to hell. People choose themselves where they want to go. To as many as received him, gave he the right or the authority to be called the children of God. So what has to happen? You have to receive him. Is God going to force you to receive him? No, never. But he always is there to give you the opportunity. And until the day you die, you have that opportunity to give your life to Jesus and to follow him. But after that, it says, appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. And these guys don't like the idea of judgment. They don't like the fact that Jesus preached more about hell than almost anything else. Because hell is a very real place. And Jesus didn't want anybody to go there. But Jesus preached extensively about hell. You go look it up, all of the different places. What is what is, the, what is the challenge about that? That God is all loving, but He's all holy. He's all righteous. Why do you think Jesus had to go to the cross? Because God's righteous judgment had to be satisfied. We know these things, but when certain people twist and just try to deceive with certain, with certain wrong ideas, you'll be amazed how they have to cut sections out of the Bible and they look down the telescope and they try to see a way that they can exclude the rest of Scripture from their teaching. Another one where 
there is an opening is that there is the fear of man that brings a snare. And the fear of man is a dreadful thing where you are scared what somebody else is going to say. Somebody else is going to do. So you go along with them. And after a while, you suddenly find yourself dragged into something. A dear, dear friend of mine um, married a, a woman who was into Scientology, which is one of those cults. And it's not a Christian thing. It believes a whole lot of science fiction. And it's literally a science fiction. It was started by a man who said, well, what's the best way to make money? You can start a business or you can start a religion. Start your religion, you'll make more money. And so this, this organization made an absolute fortune with crazy stuff. And if you were to go and read what they actually believe, it's mind-boggling crazy. But once you've got people into it, the fear of man brings a snare because once you leave, you lose so much money and you lose the support and they knit you in socially that you are so trapped you can't get out. And any kind of deception works like that. Then there is another one, and I've already spoken about the telescope, but there is a thing where people make themselves unaccountable. Do you know that if you don't have people in your life who can speak into your life, Maybe it's some elders, maybe a deacon, maybe it's a, a life group leader or a cell group leader. Christians who, are, who love you enough to watch over you and to ask you the hard questions. I have a very precious group of elders around me in this assembly. I have a regional forum that I'm part of. And they are more than welcome to ask me the hard questions. And when they do, I so welcome it. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But I respect it because it helps me to see myself through somebody else's eyes. And that is very, very important to say spiritually healthy. Sometimes, if you have a low self-esteem, somebody you make yourself open for somebody to make a fuss of you. And I saw that with a very dear pastor's wife that uh, in a church that I knew up, up in Johannesburg who really loved God, had a wonderful marriage, really loved her husband, and still does. But there came a flatterer. And because the, the dear lady had a low self-esteem about certain areas in her life, this flatterer was able to persuade her to uh, appoint him in a certain area in ministry. And before, before we knew it, the, uh, that area of the ministry was a big mess. Fortunately, the matter was turned around before it became too destructive and there was a restoration and the deceiver was able to be removed out of that situation. But low self-esteem opens doors to being seduced from moving from the throne where you are. Fortunately, there was no sexuality involved in that situation. It was just a ministry situation. But many times that has happened in other churches, in other situations. And then, of course, you get the openings. If you go to a play with a Ouija board, or if you play with going to a diviner, or reading tea leaves, or any of those foolish things, the enemy puts you under obligation. It's like he gets a thing, a little claw into your life. And you will always find that, you're, that, you're a, that something's wrong. There's a cloud over you. If maybe you got stuck into some kind of a game, uh, maybe a seance, one of those things where they have that automatic writing or they move the glassy, glassy, speaking to so-called speaking to the dead. Do you know those things give the enemy legal right in your life? And you're deceived if you think it doesn't matter. You need to get rid of those things. So let's, let's look at a couple more scriptures and, um, and just see how that is going as we do. Hallelujah. I'm going to just read a, uh, a little, let's read a scripture. Let's, where, where we, here we are. Here we go. Let's read the consequences of deception. Here is one. Galatians chapter 6 and from verse 6 through to verse 15. It says there, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit 
will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. That's wonderful. When I spend time with God, when I pray in the Spirit, when I invest in God, it brings us incredible harvest of everlasting life. But there's the opposite is also true, that if I'm sowing to my flesh, if I'm not investing in the things of God, what happens? You reap corruption. And we deceive. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And there are so many do not be deceived in the New Testament. And this is one of them. That where people think they can avoid the consequences of the areas in their life. And if you're not sowing the seed where it needs to be sowed in your life, there are going to be consequences that you don't like. So there is a challenge. Now, I'm going to try and, and land this in a minute. And uh, I think we've kind of gone far enough. But let's read this one last scripture. And then I'm going to close uh, for this morning. It says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Second Corinthians 11 and Paul's writing there. For I have betrothed you to one husband. That's what a church planter does, what an apostle does. He plants a church and he takes a group of people and they get engaged with Jesus to be his bride. Isn't that beautiful? It says that I may present you as a chaste, a pure, pure virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not received, you may well put up with it. Now, this is a key that I think I'm going to close with this evening. And we'll look at more on this. But this is the simple thing. And you say, how do I know I'm not being deceived? Very, It's very simple. Stay simple. Keep it very simple. Stay with the basics you were taught. Stay with the simplicity of God's word. If you get stuck and you need to know and you've got hard questions, there should be spiritual ease. You should have a pastor. You should have elders. You should have people around you that are going to be able to walk through to helping you to integrate that and put the puzzle pieces together. But the Holy Spirit's already going to help you to do that. But the heart of it is keep it very, very simple. I'm going to end with, with a little testimony. When I was 14 years old, I realized that I didn't know very much about the things of God. I loved I just got a Bible. I loved the Word of God. I thought it was very, very special. And I was reading my Bible voraciously. But I realized that I could very easily go wrong. And I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, won't you show me how to follow you? I don't want to get this wrong. And I felt impressed on the inside to go before Him and make a certain commitment. And that was, Lord, I want to always stay a humble child of God. I want to stay somebody that is always ready and pure-hearted and able to recognize your voice. I don't want to ever follow the voice of a stranger. I always want to know your voice and keep it simple that you can tell me if you're unhappy about something in my life. And you know what? God has been so gracious to help me at all times, always to live in that space. At times I felt foolish because I've always kept it simple. But then at the same time, I've always felt close to Him. I want to encourage you, the heart of staying out of deception is stay locked on close to Jesus. And if you spend your time with Jesus, don't be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Don't go into another Jesus. We'll look into the, the other kinds of Jesus that you can have at, at a later stage. And then you'll see, oh, I want to stay with this one because we're presenting you the real deal. And you know, if you really understand what a 20 rand note looks like, if somebody brings you a, a counterfeit, they won't be able to get it past you. If somebody brings you a 13 rand note, you're going to say, don't waste my time. I know what the real money looks like. And if you have got a simple heart and you stay really close to Jesus, as you love his word and you say, Lord, keep me always humble, always teachable, 
always available. I'm always going to be close to you. Let's bow our head in a word of prayer. Let's pray together, shall we? Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for your wonderful love for us. And we thank you that your word and your kindness and your grace is always there for us. Father, we thank you for your kindness. We just bring before you each and every person who's listening to your word this evening. And Father, we trust that you'll be speaking to us and guiding us. And Lord, if there's any areas in our lives where we have been in deception, that you would reveal it to us and that you'll help us to walk into a wholeness and a straightness in our lives. And Father, we thank you this morning for your grace, for keeping us in the middle of your will and in the middle of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for spending time with us. And I trust that you'll be greatly blessed and that you'll have a wonderful week. And uh, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. God bless you.